Uh, so I've, I've got a question for you. Those uh, mice that were exposed to rapamycin at an early age, it sounds like it retarded development and possibly reproduction, but they, did they still live longer anyway? Um, actually, yes. They, 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 still, they still live longer, they, but they were smaller. They reproduced less, but they did live longer. In fact, we've now started it as early as four months, and they live proportionally much longer than when you started it at 20 months. So enjoying a longer childhood and that of in kids. Some people may not see that as detrimental, still living longer. <laughs> uh, and right. the second question is, is this a class effect? Is it, are there, do the other mycins also show similar effect, or is it just rapamycin? I'm sorry, what was that again? Is it a class effect? Do you see it with the other mycins? Oh, oh, oh. So uh, we, we haven't tried it with the other mycins. Okay. So, so, I, so I don't know that. Okay, and maybe I'll have Jim introduce himself and ask his question. Uh, hi, I, I'm Jim Glasheen with Technology Partners, uh, another venture firm. Um, uh, a question. Uh, so uh, in, in exploring evolutionary medicine, um, my, my one idea on Darwinian medicine was uh, inoculating uh, people with with drug sensitive uh, bugs, which uh, I think went over like a lead balloon. So uh, l l let's take another shot at this. Um, ha how about in the realm of of uh, maybe Lamarckian medicine, um, uh, given the opportunities for epigenetics and methylation of the DNA, and perhaps that being heritable uh, going forward. Uh, for instance, in this rapamycin, uh, well, I guess you're doing that after they've already had their kids. So um, are, th are there examples uh, that you see where... Uh, uh, there, there was a worm, a worm study recently from, from here, actually, um, showing that, uh, that basically epigenetic marks, that ep epigenetic changes that increase life in a worm, was that, that effect was preserved for two generations subsequently to that. It, it, it was it was really a, a, a nice result and a shocking result. This gives me an opening to, to mention something else about th that ties in with the earlier things that we talked about today. And it also has to do with an evolutionary perspective on the environment in which you do your experiments. For all the infectious disease people, we have spent years in the aging biz trying to get all the infectious agents out of our colony. So we don't know how much of what we think makes animals live longer and stay healthier would be true if they lived like we do in a pathogen-rich environment. Also, we don't know how many of our results are due to the environmental conditions. For instance, the people that study aging in worms, which have made enormous contributions to the field by identifying genes associated with longer life, the big celebrity gene in worms that makes worms live about twice as long. If instead of growing worms in auger, you grow them in soil, which is where they normally live, you get a reversal of the lifespan effect. The longer life one lives shorter, and the normal one lives longer. So evolutionary thinking and, and thinking about the environment in which we do our experiments has, has, has really not been fully explored yet. <laughs> That's probably far afield from the original No, question. no, that's fantastic. Trey? So I'm Trey Vassallo. I'm an investor at Kleiner Perkins. I am not a life science expert, and I think uh, June invited me here because I'm turning 40 on Monday, so obviously <laughs> aging is on top of my mind these days. Um, <laughs> so uh, a couple questions. One, one was actually on the, what you just brought up, June, which was, sort of the notion that the dietary restriction, because you're doing that, are you actually reducing unintended toxins in what you're actually feeding animals and so, or people, and therefore that is giving them a, a boosted immune response? So, so that was question one. I'll let you respond. In so, yeah, th there's been a, a ton of research on the, the component of the diet matter. Could there be unacknowledged toxins in the diet? It doesn't look like that at this point. Um, it doesn't look like either of them is, is true. That is, uh, it seems to work in worms and flies and mice and rats, and it seems to work on synthetic diets, 
where you're controlling everything that goes in as well as natural diets. So I, I, don't, think it, I don't think it's that. And the other question is, if you thought about this in people, how, how do you implement it? I mean, is that talking about reducing the calories from our modern society by 30%? Or is it taking a traditional diet? Actually, I didn't realize those things aren't all that different. So I guess that's not really that's not really a problem. The other thing is you don't get the same thing from exercise. You can get just as skinny by exercising, and if you're a mouse, that doesn't that doesn't do the same thing. So, so my follow-up question was really on rapamycin. So are you proposing that's a wonder drug? And then the, the ramification of that is really gets to, to something I saw when, in your talk that I saw online, which is the ethical dilemma around that. I, you still have to die. So you're, you're prolonging death by a period of time. Death is messy. Uh, and so you know there are obviously some advantages over a period of time. But then at some point, you still have to go through some sort of bodily destruction process. So you know. It's, you spent a fair amount of time thinking about this, so it'd be great to, to hear sure. something. Sure. So, so first, this is rapamycin a wonder drug? Um, I'm, I'm not a rapamycin evangelist, uh, unlike somebody, uh, some of the people at my institution. If we think about the number of drugs that have cured cancers in, in mice, cured Alzheimer's disease in mice, but they haven't worked for people, it's a whole other discussion about, we've, we've, put, we've basically bet the whole farm on mice, and I think that's a huge mistake. So maybe, maybe not. I'm, I'm agnostic uh, about that. The ethical implications of, you know, I've had people yell at me, what, you're trying to make people live longer? And, and the answer is no, trying to make people healthy, healthier, and stay healthier longer. I think that's an easier sell. And, and I also think it's something that we've done historically. The, the, the you know, Ily Mechnikov, the Nobel Prize winning physiologist, complained about the number of people the state had to support in terms of health care, uh, you know, over the age of 70. And this was in France in 1907, where life expectancy was 50 years. So somehow we've muddled through. I don't think we're ethically degenerate now compared to then. So I think that these are serious problems, but they're serious problems whether we slow the aging rate or not that we're going to have to deal with. You, you highlighted the trade-offs between old age and, and earlier life. Uh, and uh, is one way to think about this, uh, the diseases that are super prevalent late in life, are they likely markers for some, some favorable trait early, early in life? And, and maybe that's just a basic science question, but it'd be interesting. Yeah, it, I think it's fascinating. The antimicrobial effects of A-beta, those are really interesting. Uh, Cellular senescence, the, 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 the capacity for cells to stop dividing after a certain number of times, that certainly is a wonderful cancer prevention uh, uh, mechanism early in life. Later in life, those cells pile up and they do cause all kinds of problems. So I think that's a very interesting way to actually think about what goes on with aging. Let's take questions from the audience, but I've got to ask the audience a question. Maybe somebody can answer this. One of the things I heard was acute fasting actually improves your ability to contend with certain stresses, so such as ischemic reperfusion. And as most of you know, a lot of major procedures in the hospital are done NPO, which means nothing per os. And we do it, we believe, to prevent aspiration risk, but is it possible that some of the benefits are because we haven't put anything in our mouths. And sometimes you might be NPO for two days because surgery is delayed. Anybody have experience doing surgeries and noticing pe people just do better? I, I can say there is a, a sort of small study by Walter Longo where he had people, people fasted from, I think it was two to seven days before getting chemotherapeutic treatments. And then they filled out questionnaires about side effects. And they reported many fewer, and that's a weak because it's not blind I and mean, there's all kinds of problems. But I think it's provocative enough that I would think that, that you know, people would, clinicians would be interested. Oh. Yes, hey, right. Surgeon, um, yeah. We make everybody NPO, mm -hmm. practice, but now I have a new argument when the patient, <laughs> I have a new argument when the patient complains to me at one o'clock, I haven't eaten since yesterday. Right. You're gonna do better because you're fasting. There's good data to support this, so quit arguing with me about eating. <laughs> <laughs> good, good. Questions, please. 
Casper in the back. The fact that calories haven't changed. I'm wondering to what extent this isn't coming from just a narrowing of conditions when we are evolved to deal with a huge range of inputs. And I'm, I guess, from the, from the, um, you know, let's say that caloric, uh, the, the average calories didn't change substantially from between cultures, but I suspect that there's a lot more variation in daily caloric intake or weekly caloric intake in the more primitive cultures, whereas we are very stable with our intake. Um, and there's some evidence with obesity, for example, that you develop, you know, obesity going to diabetes it comes from this belt, if you will, of adipose tissue. And there seem to be quite a few adipose uh, senescent cells. If you can kill them off, exercise kills them off. And if you kill them off uh, uh, chemotherapeutically, you actually get a rejuvenated mouse uh, as an example. So I, I guess I'm just wondering, it doesn't really fit in with the, um, the rapamycin uh, story, but I'm just wondering to what extent we are designed to deal with the huge variance of conditions, and that's what the body's evolved to do. And by having a homogeneous environment and inputs, you actually you get maladapt maladaptation. That's a really interesting point, and it, it, and it could be one of the reasons that sh if these short-term fasts turn out to be as beneficial as they look like if you're a mouse, then it would make a certain amount of evolutionary sense if that's one of the if that high variability in food intake is something that we evolved with, then we might have mechanisms to deal with that in such a way that it actually preserves health. I certainly my experience. I I spent a few years working in Papua New Guinea with some uh, uh, people that still hunted with spears and arrows and all that, and I can tell you that their daily food intake was. 100 times more variable than ours. Some days, some days it was nothing, some days they gorged. It, it, it was very different. I suspect that's your experience as well. Humans' uh, dynamic range has declined in so many other ways too. We are exposed to less dynamic range of light variation, not enough during the day, too much at night. Uh, also thermal variation, we used to live in ambient temperature and now we live in 70 degrees Palo Alto all the time. Next question, please. Have you done any omics evaluations? Uh, yeah, there's some 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 uh, metabolomics and some proteomics about to be published on the rapamycin mice. Is that what you're talking about? Yes. So uh, where are you? Uh, right. Yes, but I can't. Get, it's not my work. I don't want to. I don't want to talk about anybody else's work. But we do have some things that are just about to be published on on caloric restriction, rapamycin proteomic and, and metabolomic analysis of similarities and differences between the two things, although both chronic treatments. Um, I guess two short questions. One is, to follow up on the Lamarckian uh, medicine, have you tried giving rapamycin to the mice up until the, just before they get pregnant and then see if the pups live longer, see if there's an epigenetic uh, inheritance there? Uh, no. No, it's that's a that's a neat experiment though. Well, one of the fun things that a colleague of mine did, a neighbor of yours, Judy Campisi, at the Buck Institute, is that she's actually treated senescent cells with rapamycin. One of the problems with senescent cells is that they tend to secrete a lot of bad things for the local environment. What she finds is that when she treats the cells with rapamycin, it reduces that secretory phenotype that seems to be so destructive to the local tissue, so. Yeah, but my second question actually follows up on that point, which is there's this recent experiment where they triggered apoptosis instead of senescence, um, and, and it had all these benefits. So do you have a, a hypothesis for why, why we have senescent cells? Why not just trigger apoptosis? I mean, I understand you, you don't want uh, damaged cells or to hang around to cause cancer, but if you clear them from apoptosis, that would solve that problem. So why senescent? Yeah, senescent. I do have a hypothesis, uh, but it's not mine. It's Judy's. So I'll steal it as long as I give her credit. The, uh, if you look at uh, wound healing, so if you wound a young animal, what you get is a burst of senescent cells because it's not just cell replication that causes senescence. It's also cellular stress. And it turns out that if you remove those senescent cells, wounds actually heal more slowly. So it could be that there's this early life benefit that, again, a trade-off turns into a late life detriment. 
For the sake of the audience, can you describe Lamarckian evolution, the idea of somatic, in, somatic traits being inherited? Can somebody describe that? Can you? <laughs> Your question. <laughs> Your question. My question, my fault. Uh, so Lamarckian evolution, at least in, in the way that I was using it, uh, is the notion of, uh, of one passing down the traits that are acquired over the course of a lifetime. Uh, so often seen as the, the opposite of, of Darwinian evolution uh, and, uh, and, and rightly thrown, thrown into the trash heap uh, with, with the acceptance uh, of, of Darwin's theory, um, the, the giraffe neck. Uh, um, sort of story behind it, but uh, the the reason to to think about it in this context is we've been hearing about the notion that there's a number of epigenetic uh, effects. So when your uh, genes are affected by methylation uh, over the course of your life, uh, you can indeed perhaps pass along some some of your your traits to to your offspring. Did I do that right? Yeah, weightlifters have stronger babies. That's the way I, 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 I describe, <laughs> I, I describe Lamarckian evolution. I was wondering um, what happens to telomere length in the rapid mice and treated mice and also the calorically restricted mice? Yeah, that's, that's actually uh, quite interesting. One of the things that didn't come up in the, in the cancer talk, uh, which I was trying to get a question, but I didn't, is that in many respects, mice are horrible models for people and a telomere dynamics is one of the places that they are because mice have these enormously long telomeres that don't shorten appreciably over the course of a lifetime whereas that's not true for us so i don't think they've looked at telomere length in the calorie restricted monkeys and there was no effect but I don't think they've been able to do this in calorie-restricted mice because the telomeres are so long that it would, they're, they're, there's such a small amount of shortening. It could be that I missed a paper on that. We, we certainly, it hasn't been looked at yet in rapamycin, and I can tell you that. I'd love to wrap up. <laughs> <laughs>